Hello, beautiful human. <laughs> I am Zach. That is Dana. We welcome yep. back to the studio. Kesha. Yo. It's a, Hello. It, <laughs> it's an honor to have you here. It's an honor every time to be here. You really are incredible, and your energy is uh, pretty infectious. And okay. uh, you are, I, you know, I, you're sitting on the couch the way you've sat on the couch the last two times. And I did say, like, you are consistent. But the truth is, this album is anything but consistent, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like this was a major left turn for fans maybe it was it made perfect sense in my mind but the response i've been getting is any anybody that has listened to it loves it but they're like what the fuck where's the chick we once knew and i have to just like keep reminding people that she died is it, she's dead is 100 percent of her gone no she's like my little sister like i I like watch who she was and what she did and it's like charming and cute and I'm happy she existed, but I'm just a different person and like, I can't sleep on that and it would be a shame for the world to sleep on that because I'm so much more in touch with who I am. I feel so much more complete and it's so sick to like have made this album and kind of walk through this psychedelic journey of sound with Rick Rubin, the greatest yeah. living producer. It's been such an honor and a privilege. And I've been changed. Like, Why was he the person to help really bring your truth to life? He was he's such a kind, funny, beautiful, calm, grounding, safe, gentle man. And every time I would walk in the studio, there was this love and acceptance. And it felt like I was in the presence the presence of a Zen master or something. Was it unlike a, any other city you've ever walked into? And un, the polar fucking opposite. Uh, what, what did he bring out of you that nobody else has? Feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And when you feel safe, you can do much better work, I've realized. Um... You can really dive into who you are. You can go to your humanity. It doesn't all have to be this bullshit bravado that at times really served me. But to be honest with you, like I'm so much more secure and I'm so confident in who I am and what I stand for. And my foundation feels unfucking shakable. Like I feel like a strong motherfucker. More so than ever before. Isn't that beautiful? I feel like a goddess what, with a flamethrower. But, but, but what is happening? What is evolving to get you to that point? I feel like when you've endured things and you live through it and you realize your power and your strength and you can look back and be so proud of yourself... And I also am in the position where a lot of my life has, whether I liked it or not, been up for public consumption. <laughs> so there's a line in Only Love Can Save Us Now where it's, I don't, I don't got no shame left. Baby, that's my freedom. And I had to just really embrace the fact that I don't have anything, I don't have anything to hide. And even if I want to hide something, that right has been taken away from me. Well, that's that is terrifying to even say, right? Because everybody should have the right to hold a secret. Everybody should they have the should. right to absolutely. They should, and I have not had that right. So, if that's the position I'm in, then ain't no motherfucker gonna take me down. <laughs> you know, a lot of people would say that that younger version, the younger sister of who you are today was this fierce feminine icon, this this force to be reckoned with, this this brand, this individual, this thing that would usher in a whole new generation for what it meant to be a woman. Yeah, I hope so because ever since I was little I always fought for every time I would see a boy doing something I would say like, if he can do it, why can't I do it? Even in fourth grade, I remember going to Catholic school and 
I wore the boys outfit and I got in so much trouble. I got smacked on the hand and I would still never got an answer though. Like if the boys can do it, why can't I? And that has been like my lifelong quest is like, can somebody answer this question? So that continued into my music. And there's always been this like fierce feminist lioness inside of me. And I feel like she had a little bit more reckless abandon and a little stupider, younger, more naive, um, hadn't been through as much pain. And I feel like I've just really harnessed who I am and making gag order. I had to weed through a bunch of anger and hurts that I just wanted to ignore forever. So are you weeding through that? In process in the studio, or are you doing that in therapy out of studio and then going in? And oh, all of it. Oh, I do everything. I do like therapy. I do energy work, acupuncture, yoga, um, like chanting, breathing. I work with Ramdas organization, and we just like we'll have group chants. Um, I write lists. I burn them. I swim naked in the ocean. I have witches covens. Like you name it, I do tarot cards. You name it, I do it. But How I, does that work against? You have a strong sense for religion. That is still obvious. Not religion, spirituality. I think religion is. Or, I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person, but I find religion very interesting because it's collected groups of people searching for what is the collective source energy and we all want to put a name to it and some boundaries on it but I think what source energy is what if you use the word God it's all encompassing it's all one I agree with that so yeah I've always been obsessed and searching for my connection to the to the source so Jesus comes up on the album God is mentioned on the album how does that play into a witch's coven well really all we're doing is a group of women gather and make a safe place for each other, which is not unlike going to the studio with Rick Rubin. Like it's women that make space for the emotion, for the anger. Life is really fucking unfair. And yet being a woman on top of it, there's so much inherent pain. Just speaking of like month to month basis. Then there's the emotional pain. Then we create humans that populate the world. And then The world goes to war and those children, some of them die in war. Like women have to endure all of this pain and hold it down. So it's really important for me to surround myself with strong women where we can make space to unleash our emotions because in society, if you have an emotion or a reaction to something that is unfair that is happening in the world, you are then a crazy woman. And that's fucked up. Having an emotional reaction to something that is unfair is natural. So to only hold space for people that can understand that and accept that about you is why I feel like I'm a lioness. I'm a goddess. I'm a powerful woman. And I want to create that space for any woman or man. You know, your feminine energy is not gender dependent. We all have it. So I just want to create that space for my fans, my friends, my family, everyone, because you should be able to express your emotions in a safe space that is accepting. And then you work through it and you burn shit and you scream and you run through the woods, you jump in the ocean and then you watch Vanderpump Rules together. (laughs) Healthy. It's fucking healthy. (laughs) How many songs do you finish with Rick Rubin before you uh, before you can whittle it down to this album? Or is what we got on this album gag order exactly what was done? Uh, no, I actually came in with a, almost a hundred songs. <laughs> I think it was 70 to 80, somewhere so in there. Are you going to Rick with songs written or are you going? Mm-hmm. You're... Well, I went with a bunch of songs at first and he listened through to them. Very few of those, if any, made the final album. I'm trying to remember exactly, but we would redress them in different production clothes. So I went... I went to him, had a meeting, played him songs. We were just shooting the shit about spirituality and being Pisces and bonded. And then and then we got in the studio and it was truly felt like 
like there was a such a huge shift it was like this cosmic it was a miracle like working with him was a fucking miracle and i'm not using that word lightly miracle and for the art you created for you personally like what is it i think both i think the art is the best art i've ever made i think it's i think it's a classic album i think time will prove that i really believe that and i've never felt this way or talked this way about any of my art and if people are going to sleep on it that's on them but this is this is a classic album and is it a, that's a new thing for you to have to come to terms with, right? This idea that, and I'll say this, like, it could be a grower, not a shower, right? That's like, what I say to everyone. I'm like, listen, you have to spend time with her. Yeah. <laughs> like, you spend time with her, you nurture her. And if you understand her, you will, she will take you to the depths. It's like pure femininity. When what you've done in the past has been clear and obvious right like you go back to the first hit ever i mean as clear as fucking day you hear that song and you go yeah i mean maybe not every programmer was able to see potential but anybody who had the right set of ears that was meant to be in that position would hear all of the hits that you've crafted before and been like oh, this just makes sense this is it this there's hooks everywhere out the ass it's like the most, the right amount of detail and pop culture mentions while still being fierce and powerful. Like there, it was just, it was a shower, not a grower. Yeah, that one was a shower for sure. And I think when you have spent so many years in this pop machine that is this hall of mirrors and you are held to such standards of perfection that it's really unhealthy. And it's not realistic. And you know that a song needs to be X amount of time. This is what's going to do well on the radio. You know, when you're gorilla trained in that, it becomes a certain level of brainwashing. A hundred percent. And so I found working with Rick to be the miracle of breaking down the illusion of what music is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be manufactured to sell X amount of things because the algorithm, like it's supposed to be a reflection of who you are and your energy and your perspective and your way to cope and what's going on inside your head. Were you able to find any balance with your earlier work where it was, yes, a pop hit, but also was representative of you at that moment in time? There's a part I love, but there's a part that is forever tarnished. When you hear them out and about because you're guaranteed to, mm -hmm. is your reaction that of happy that it's yours or that of get me the fuck out of here? Um, to be honest with you, my fans have helped me create memories with each of these songs that then makes me smile. Thinking about hearing TikTok on a plane with these kids kicking my seat and I was like, these kids are so annoying. And then they started <laughs> singing TikTok and I was like, oh my God, they're so cute. I want to, I want to take the kids home with me. Like, and seeing people bond my music and be in the crowd and share memories with me and get engaged or played at their wedding like those are the memories with those songs that I love so you know it's it's a weird relationship it's a really weird relationship I'm really proud because they they are mine I made them I am the artist and at the time there was very little credit given there was also like Rick Rubin did this beautiful thing of helping me wean off autotune like a drug. Like he, I th begged for it in the studio. I'd be like, please, please give me autotune. And he had this, like, we had to have a sit down conversation. Like I was coming off a drug and he was like, I don't know how else to tell you that you don't need this. And how special is that though? But also hard to hear or? No, I, I feel so sad for the self I was that believed I needed it. And I realize now it was just uh, a way to keep me insecure. Your relationship with a song like Praying. Praying. That's beautiful. Praying. And that's yours, is, right? Fully. Praying is mine. No, the, the work I did on 
rainbow was really, really special too. But I haven't worked with a producer that oversaw an entire album. Top to bottom. Top to bottom until Rick. And by the way, Rick, I'm, I don't know timeline for sure, but I would assume that he was probably coming off of doing the album with Neil Young at this point in time. Oh, I was there at the same time that Neil Young was there. He's, we were... I don't want to say we're friends with Neil Young, but like you're I, friends with Neil Young. I mean, yeah. Flex. Well, I mean, <laughs> flex the muscle. If it's true, go on. No, I, we're friendly with yeah. Neil Young. Well, like, he, has he done the show? Yeah, yeah, he came on the show and he called me personally to come on the show from his fucking flip phone. It was pretty sick to talk about the the album with Rick Rubin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Uh, and then it was, yeah, but like Neil Young doesn't. You know, he only does things that Neil Young wants to do because like. Later that day, I got an email from my Post Malone's manager asking if I can connect him with Neil Young because they wanted to know if he wanted to go to Post Malone's show. And I asked them, and Neil was like, fuck no. Why would I want to go there? <laughs> oh, my God. I... <laughs> like, he literally does what he, you know what I mean? Like, it's yes, fucking Neil Young. Yes, I do. It's fucking Neil. Like, Neil Young <laughs> was on the mountain at Shangri-La. I'm recording in, a like, a burnt-out chapel at Shangri-La. Have you been? I have, yeah. Okay, so you know the chapel. I'm recording in there. And in the vocal booth, there's stacks of Neil Young tapes. And I literally sat and meditated in there with them, Special. like praying to Neil Young. And then he ended up coming in a couple months later and recording. So I would be taking like a dinner break and I would sit on the grass and you could play, you could hear him playing guitar over the mountain. That's, that's why it's a miracle. Yeah, that's like amazing. that's why the making of this album was a fucking miracle. And like that's real music. Like you're around, you. There's no bullshit that exists on that campus. And no. by the way, that whole Neil Young project was done on like, like he did it on like reel to reel or whatever the fuck. None of it was digital. None no. of it was digital. No, it's all real music. <laughs> it's like not corny garbage. <laughs> it's classic real music made by talented people that have something to say. And like Neil, and Dylan. And Dolly, Dude, jo and Joni Mitchell, Iggy Pop, Joni Mitchell, like those are the artists I listen to and never thought I could ever be in the same arena as. And Rick has opened up my eyes to the fact you are in the, it. Well, the only thing you have to do is just open your heart up and like surround yourself with good people. It's, it, it, it's not that easy, but it is when you have the in, innate talent and you have an incredible baseline and foundation of a gift. Yeah. But it's also the scariest and hardest thing to do because finding the right people to curate the right space that allows you to be exactly what you want to be and what you, what not only you know you can be, but what they also know you can be. It's yeah. really challenging. Oh my God. Especially if you've been surrounded previously with people that are really nurturing the opposite of that emotion in you. And in these sessions, or at least for some of the records, you're kind of bringing the two together, right? You're, you're at least exploring lyrically and story-wise what was with yeah. the group of people who are trying to bring out the best in you in the, in what is the newest possible way, yeah. the best possible way. Absolutely. It was just so cool to have somebody also care. Like, he cared. Remember, there was one day we were in the studio and they were sorting out some like microphone technical problem that I did I had no business trying to help solve. Um, he looked at me and he was like, "I just want you to know, like, I care about every single opinion you have on every single part of this." And and I just started crying. Like the first three weeks with Rick, I also just, the whole experience I've been so grateful for because I would just go in and like have these emotional breakthroughs and breakdowns and he would just be so patient and allow. And then when I was done, he's like, all right, let's, let's work on the song. Are you getting a better product or a more honest product when you're writing immediately after having those emotional breakdowns or breakthroughs? Oh, my God. There's certain songs. Tell me if they fall out. You're There's good. certain songs on the record where I know the headspace I was in when I wrote it, so it's hard for me to listen to as if you're watching someone, like, have a breakdown. It's hard to watch. Well, to me, it's, like, hard to listen to myself going through such hard times. 
but I'm also proud of myself for being so honest because once you're honest, you are free. Mm. There's nothing left. You can't take anything. You can't hurt me. Like, hate me fucking harder. That's what that song's about. Like, taking all a person can take. And I'm stronger than ever. So hate me harder. A record like that, is that happening in the moment? Or are you coming in with exactly what you want to talk about? No, that was like a, it was a development. Like, I came in with songs. A lot of them didn't end up making the final product. And the one song I did come in with was Eat the Acid. It was kind of the catalyst of the album. And the night before I wrote Eat the Acid, it was when we were in lockdown, super anxious, questioning my, like, meaning of exi- meaning of existence just because, you know, being an artist in quarantine was it was hard for fucking everybody it was collectively traumatic period of time but for me it was really difficult emotionally personally and i i thought i was experiencing this psychotic breakdown or something because i felt i started to meditate and i started to like hear almost like what i now consider to be my highest consciousness start speaking to me started seeing visuals it's completely sober um sober 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 mm. and i was so scared because of course like i'm an emotional person i'm an artist i'm not like quintessentially the most probably normal human on the earth. So I was like, oh, awesome. I'm having a psychotic breakdown. Cool. Great. Um, But the next day, I like my first phone call was to my therapist. And I was like, hey, so last night I had this psychotic breakdown. Like, what do I do now? And I explained the whole thing to her. Way too casual. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I was like, okay, just I need a plan. What's the plan? What do you do when this happens? And she said that it it had sounded like I'd actually experienced an ego death and a spiritual awakening. Sick. And so I decided, like, there's nothing I can do about it now. I might as well just lean into it. And so since that moment, I got out of bed and wrote Eat the Acid, and I knew that was the story of the album, is I wanted to put a sound and words to what having a spiritual awakening and ego death and the the dissolving of all illusions of what I thought life was and who I thought I was, watching that dissolve into nothingness, I wanted to make a record that sounded like that and really chronicled the, the experience of having everything fall and rebuilding in a way where I truly feel like I've set fire to my past and I'm now standing on the ashes completely cleansed. That, Without that spiritual awakening, the ego death, it's fair to say that we wouldn't have this album today, yeah? No, I would have never made this album. I feel like there's no way because that was really like it was the catalyst for the album that was what kind of what i think i mean you'd have to ask him but i think rick and i connected on both being um, spiritual seekers and i think he found trying to make a sonic landscape of what that experience is i think he was interested in helping me find that especially for someone who's like has my history so no, I definitely wouldn't have made this album at all. I think I, you know, I have no idea what it would have been. I don't know what it would have been. Would that other Kesha even still be around? Who knows? I don't know. But I feel like that night, literally, it feels like she died that night. And I don't, and I'm not sorry. And I'm not going to pretend like she didn't. Didn't something else happen around that time where your cat brought you your headphones or something? That was that night. 
that was the night because I was having so much anxiety and I was laying in bed being like, what do you do? Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm so panicked. And my cat, it's a very smart boy, he <laughs> has never done it before and he's never done it since, but he put my headphones in his mouth and he like brought on his fat little body, like <laughs> dropped them on my chest. And I was like, okay, I guess that means it's time to meditate because I put the headphones in when I meditate. And then that's when, like, the voice came through and the vision start started. What are you seeing? It was similar to the Peter Max who did Yellow Submarine. Mm, yeah. Like, that kind of visual. Like, all the kind of quintessential psychedelic visuals. Super bright colors. Super bright colors and, like, this... This... How do I... It was, like... I zoomed out from the self and saw that we're all connected and how the the world is all just like kind of a microcosm of everything. Like we're all just so connected. It's true. And it just kind of echoes out. And I understood kind of love for the first time, like an egoless love. Where, and then I ended up breaking up my engagement because it was like huh. you truly love someone. It's not right to, there's selfish love and then there's not selfish love. And I want to be full of the not selfish love. Can you describe the difference? For me, I think there was like an element of trying to keep things together because I didn't want to hurt myself. I didn't want to hurt him. Um, I wanted to, want to make something work, but I feel like the tr- the truest kind of love is I want him to be happy and I want to be happy. And if the two can go coexist together, they'll find each other again. But for the meantime, we're just really good friends. That's, that's like the hardest thing about love, right? Because if you genuinely love someone, you want the best for them. And it's hard because then when your self gets in the way, yeah, because maybe you're not the best for them. Yeah, or maybe parts of them just, like, you don't like, and instead of trying to change them, like, let them be themselves. And grow. And grow in whatever direction that is. And to try to cling on to something, the more desperately you try to cling on to anything, I feel like the faster it leaves. I feel like it's almost like you spend a lot of time in nature, and if you sit, then the animals will kind of come to you. It's like the law of attraction, too. Uh-huh. So I can try to chase something, romantic, money, anything, it's going to run. Because what, what do things usually do when you chase them? Yeah, they, they run. run away. So I think it's just energetically kind of taking from like Zen Buddhism to just being like good with myself and loving myself, which is such a corny, like cringe, like well, whatever. But you do have to love yourself. And I didn't really realize that before. I always like preach the word of loving yourself, but sometimes loving yourself means letting yourself get fucking angry. Mm. And I've never been angry before in my life. With Rick, he was like, "It's okay. You can. I want you to get angry." I love the anger, and only love can save us. Thank you. It sounds so good. Thanks. I was so scared because going back to this like sacred feminine nobody likes an angry woman like you don't want to deal with an angry woman they're crazy i did a show called conjuring kesha last year and there was this place where there were ten thousand lobotomies given to women and you could get them just by like having pms so we're not that far away from that time they weren't doing lobotomies in the 90s but they closed the place in the 90s that's fucked up. The world is fucked up. And we all have a right to be angry. We not live in the anger, but to walk through it. Mm. And I got the chance to walk through it with Rick. And now I feel like I just feel so strong and so powerful. It's very cool. But I had to go through like some dark moments to get to that point. Would you say this music is solely for you? Mm. I made it for myself which is the first time I've ever made an album entirely for myself, not considering what 
song would do what or what song's the right length or if anybody's going to like it or who's going to play it. That was not a conversation I once ever had with Rick. It was never brought up. And I'm assuming like that's the first time that conversation wasn't brought up in that <laughs> setting. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was like... That was uh, the first conversation you'd have. It's like the first conversation any for... I feel like I'm like a recovered pop thing. I don't know how else to describe it. Like, and I didn't even know it at the time. That's, was it hard to accept once you were aware? Of course. I'm filled with like all this kind of, um, I reflect a lot and try to work through it. But I was young and I didn't know any better. That's what the line in fine line is. There's a fine line between happy and stupid as fuck. Because when you're just like naive to things, it's a lot easier to just be happy. But once you start seeing things, which I talk about and eat the acid, once kind of the illusions start to fall and you see things for what they are, you can't unsee them. And there's a lot more to be angry about when you start really paying attention. Because a lot of, I, for a long time, I made music that was escapist music, which I think we all need an escape. Escapism is beautiful. But to not have the ability to really balance up until praying came out, then I feel like, you know, there were 10 years of escapism, and now it's been 10 years of reflection. The pendulum had to swing, and now I believe it's balancing out. Like, I feel like, I truly feel like the last song on this album is happy, and I realized that the entirety of my life has been striving to be, this thing and then I got to be this thing and I didn't want to let go of this thing and I have a beautiful house and I go on these vacations and I have tours and I have songs that do so well and like at the end of the day I realized there was this hole inside of me that felt so empty and I thought oh when I do all those things it will be full so I did all those things and I worked my fucking ass off and I wrote those songs and I went on those tours and I tore my ACL on stage and I, you know, the whole thing. But then when you stand and look at like, fuck, was it all worth it? Because I'm now have all the number one gold records and I have the house and I still have that hole. And it only, that hole started to only be truly healed once I walked through a lot of pain that I didn't want to deal with and I started finding some sort of self-compassion and self-love and I started letting go of the control of everything and allowing myself to be held by some sort of like universal energy. And I'm not like promoting any sort of religion or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just feel like it was I a... I think collective energy is really powerful, but also your own personal energy that you put out there is ultimately what you're going to get back. And totally. If you can't deal with anger or you just bottle it up and just stow it away, I mean, it, I don't, that's toxic. That It erodes you from the inside out. And you uh, may, may, may not even know it. A million percent. And if you just pretend like these things aren't happening inside of you, they do catch up to you. Oh, yeah. And, like, this was a moment where I think it caught up to me so hard and so fast and all in one big aggressive moment that that's what the shift was. And then the music shifted. And I really hope people can connect to it, especially if they need it, if they've had anxiety, insecurity, depression. Who hasn't? Self-doubt. Yes. Anger. Like. It's me. Really? I'm angry all the time. See, I've never been angry, and now I'm so pissed because I have, like, <laughs> 36 years of anger. I want to go, like, to those break rooms and, like, break a bunch of stuff. Sounds oh. really fun. I started doing ninjutsu. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I love the line. I'm about to blow your fucking head through the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's great. Thank you. Like, it's how I feel every morning when I wake up. Jesus. 
Honestly, though. What? Speak honestly, please. <laughs> like, I'm so sick of pretending everything's fucking fine when it's not. Like, be honest. Jesus Christ. Honesty is the best policy. Gag order is very honest. You can listen to it. And all of all of Kesha's music does exist on Amazon Music, but I highly recommend that you check out Gag Order. Or give it a listen top to bottom. There's going to be a link in the description below. Can we talk about writing Fine Line? Did that come Please. easy or was that difficult? No, that was... In- that was insufferable. That nice. song was so brutal. I went into the studio and I was like, I have this really important idea and I am freaking out. And I don't know what to do, but it's fine line, fine line. And everyone's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I was like, I was waving my arms around going, it's so important. <laughs> and everyone's like, and the room was like, okay, chill. What do you want to say? And I was like, I don't know, but like, I'm always walking this infinite, invisible line. And if I step one fucking inch to the left or right, I, it's, I'm surrounded by landmines. And does anybody else feel this way? Like, as a woman, like, being, a pop singer is one of the only professions. The longer you do it and the better you get at your craft, the more, like, the less valuable you yeah, are. That's true. It's so fucking true. <laughs> like, you age a little bit because, you know, time exists and they want to just throw you in the trash. Okay. Then you're like, okay, I'm going to, like, you know, I'll get a facelift. Let me fight the aging. Then you get, like, crucified <laughs> in entertainment. You dress sexy. You're a slut. You dress not sexy enough. Prude. You're old, you're a prude, you're disgusting. Like, you, it's just like, you can't win. I dyed my hair brown. People said I was on drugs. <laughs> I don't you. know what to fucking tell people anymore. <laughs> like, I want to just be like, yo, eat my fucking ass. <laughs> so, fine line was the moment where I was just like, no, no, no. I'm not, I can't do this shit anymore. It's exhausting. Since I was very, very young, every time I go out on stage, there's paparazzi. Oh, my God. You can see your tampon string. Yo, I am my period. Like, what do you want me to do? You you have no ass. Your ass is too big. You're what? Like, you just can't win. But can you see, though, the underlying accomplishments, though, of, like, yes, like, you're ridiculed for those things. But in the same breath, you are ushering in a new v- version of femininity, and you are a feminist icon in, 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 in order for somebody to be a feminist icon, they need to take heat from somewhere, right? Like, you're, you're not going to be... True. You don't get that title by it being, you know, roses and butterflies and people not combating your actions or your words. True. No, that's true. I never thought of it that way. It's a nice perspective. Well, I mean... Because living in the... It's hard to see. Living... Trying to walk the tightrope. It can... There are moments where I'm just like, fuck what anybody thinks. I just have to live. It's too exhausting trying to balance this tightrope act where I feel like everything I do is wrong anyways. So, yeah, I'm absolutely a feminist and I always have been. I didn't even know. I just thought that all humans should be uh, treated equal. I'm a humanist, I think. I just want all humans to be equal. And I would like... That tampon string thing is real, right? That happened to you. Um, Didn't that, or, no, it's like a constant fear, though. Every time I would go on stage, I'd be like, if I'm on my period and someone sees my tampon string, like, it'll be the end of my life. That happened to some art. I remember seeing that and, like, seeing a photo, but also thinking to myself, like, that is life, that is human, that is, I don't know, that should be normal, but whatever. I mean, it just, like, what do you want us to do? The, obviously get a lobotomy. Yeah, get a lobotomy and, like, <laughs> also, I might still get my period though, bro. <laughs> like well, I don't, I don't know. Pray it away. <laughs> Pray it away. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So, like, fine line was just encapsulating the emotion of being fed up with people pleasing everybody because you also can't. I'm not. I'm not responsible for the actions or emotions of 
anybody else but myself. So you can use me as a mirror and project onto me whatever you need to do. But it's me kind of getting to that point where it's like, I'm not going to like walk the tightrope of life anymore and try to be so fucking careful. Like before interviews, I would just get so nervous and like, you know, speak so slowly and just really make, because it's scary. Mm. Like, I don't know. It's scary when people, like, take something you say the wrong way. It's scary because sometimes I say things the wrong way. But my intention, I know what my intention is. Yeah, you're human. Intention is yeah. really what matters. Right? I think it comes down to being human. Fine line is about, like, embracing not only my, but, like, people's humanity. Like, I don't know. Just... I can't pretend to be all these things I once used to pretend to be. And I, I'm in recovery from an eating disorder, but I just remember like that. It was like trying so hard to be the right size. And there was never the number. There was never the size that was the right size. You could never be small enough. And the sicker I got, the more compliments I got. And like, that's sick. That's truly that is a sign of a sick society. And I do not want to be a part of the problem because even just by me having my own issue, it was perpetuating a problem and I didn't even realize it. But I just want to be able to be open and honest about stuff. That's a conversation that should be had more often. You know, I have a friend who suffers from an eating disorder and it's exactly that. I'll be very open. I mean, they are on Ozempic, right? Yeah. And it is drastically unsafe for them and unhealthy, yet the more weight is lost, the more compliments come their way. And at the end of the day, there is no goal weight because you said it. Like, you, you, like for somebody who's battling that or attempting to manage it, there's just no appropriate size. No. And, and that's brought on by society, by the way. It totally Directly is. Directly to blame. And it's really, I... I'm sending your friend love. And because I have been in recovery for long enough that I didn't have access to that before I was in recovery. I'm like, God only knows. I maybe would have done that at one point. Because it feels like society's telling you that's the way to be and that's what's good. And like, there's this like fine line of like, I just want to be fucking healthy. I want to be intelligent. I want to be healthy. I want to be honest. I want to, I just want to be. Yeah, but society should prop those up on a high standard, right? Like nobody's complimenting you for being kind. Nobody's complimenting you for being no. intelligent. Nobody's flooding you with <laughs> the compliments because you look, you, you, you're comfortable in your own skin and you're happy. It's no, not. We don't you don't get up. praised for that. You only get, you get clickbait. So, I do think, and that's why I wrote the song, The Drama. The drama is a commentary on society. Like, we need the drama. We feed off the drama. We love the drama. Like, we say we hate the drama. Nah. We're obs- we are addicted to the drama. It's a lifeblood because our own reality is so shit that to escape into something that is so treacherous for somebody else mm-hmm. is freeing. Yeah, and it's like... It's a it's America's greatest pastime. That's true. Is drama. Do you enjoy the drama? Of course I do. I'm human. But like I really um I try to keep it really low risk. I do not like seeing people be genuinely hurt. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even like those like videos where someone's skateboarding and they thought like I can't watch that <laughs> stuff. I don't like that kind like I like 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 real housewives just like having one drink too many and like saying something dumb like that's the drama level that's like my sweet spot but i do i think it's normal we were raised on drama oh my god yeah so like i'm human yeah we all fucking love it and i think the problem is nobody will just admit it like that song's about me being like yo we love the drama we live for it one of your first brushes with fame you were in a reality show Simple life. Oh, yikes. That <laughs> was drama. my mother. No, it's all all the reality shows. My own reality shows. It's all the drama. 
We all love the drama. Sports teams. You just want to see two people pick a color, pick a side, and then like battle each other. Literally. Everybody just likes drama. Wasn't your mom like hitting on Lana Del Rey's dad or something recently? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember seeing that headline. <laughs> See, we love the drama. Mm. The fact that you just pulled that is so funny. <laughs> My God. I I had forgotten about it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Is he married? I have no idea. I never heard about him until your mom was hitting on him. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what, do you follow her on, like, Twitter? No, it made headlines everywhere. Ay, it's like, ay, Kesha's ay. mom hits on Lana Del Rey's dad on Jesus Twitter. Jesus, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> was Gag Order always going to be the name for the album, or how did you decide on and land on that one? No, it was originally going to be called Eat the Acid, because that was the catalyst and kind of, like, the seed of the album. It's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. But then I had to take a step out. Once the once the album was made, I feel like it's like building a house. And I feel like the music is the very solid foundation. You can make like an all right foundation, a foundation that works. But I feel like we made an incredibly solid foundation. Like I said, never been more proud of anything I've ever done. Rainbow like is in the same category. But this really takes the cake. I forgot your question. Gag order was gag order. Oh, so then I had to take a step out and look at it like a like an architect, and I was like, "Oh, if I call it eat the acid, people are gonna think that my titties are falling out." Hold on. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, in. Stop it. Okay. I'm sure they're listening. They're not listening, bro. <laughs> bro, stay. Okay, so <laughs> then I was I had to like take a step out of the project and look at it. I was like, oh, people are gonna be like, she's promoting drug use, drinking, party girl because people don't get irony. And I was like, okay, I don't want to like this to be that. The whole point of eat the acid is I've never eaten acid. My mom told me not to eat acid, so I never did. So I wouldn't experience what I experienced, but then I did anyways. And so then I wanted to call it gag order because it's kind of a compilation of all the things I've always either wanted to say or wanted to dive into or I've been too scared to dive into, and I'm just, like, putting it all out there. There's a lot. I mean, there is something to the fact that when you put out this album, everybody's listening to it, and that everybody includes everybody, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And saying things that you want to say that you haven't said Mm -hmm. out of fear or whatever. I mean, there is a chance that you are, I mean, you're opening yourself up to, I mean, it could be anything, right? God only knows. I'm like, at this point, like. But again, you've been through so much. What the fuck? Like, what the fuck are you going to take now? Yeah. Do you want my eyeball? (laughs) Have it. Like, I really... I'm exhausted by the entire concept of giving a fuck like what anybody's going to take from this or project onto me. I'm entitled to my truth. All we have is that. I know. And so to not say certain things just to silence yourself for whatever reason has been incredibly frustrating it has been more frustrating than i could possibly put into words ever i hope it's a feeling no one on this planet knows i'm surprised i'm alive and i say that in the lyrics like i am proud of myself every day for still being here should be So, like, this is the compilation of everything I've needed to say. I mean, I'm sure I have a lot more (laughs) I could say, but this is the safest place for me to put so much. And I worked on it for three years. Like, there is so much that went into this. And I really hope people can take the 38 minutes to go in because I feel like it's going 
underwater or something. Like it's, I'm taking you to a whole different planet that I've never heard before. Someone yesterday compared it to Radiohead making Kid A. Eh. And I was like, listen, I'm not going to, I'm going to like love, love that, love <laughs> that comparison. But yeah, it's like, it's a whole trip. I really hope people will join me, especially because I don't want you to feel alone. If anybody else out there feels like, I don't know, anything, I think you'll relate to this No, album. you'll feel understood. And you should <laughs> listen top to bottom because I think it's the right way to consume it. We're going to put a link in the description below. You can listen to Gag Order on Amazon Music. You can also listen to all of Kesha's discography on there too. Can I say, can I say something just weirdly on topic? <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure back in 2012. <laughs> this happened? At Bamboozle. My I, titties fell out? Well, I think, did you, did, you may have been like the, did you have stars over your boobs at one point? I'm sure I did. I feel like you may have been like, like I was a pretty, you know, I'm pretty gay. And I was definitely gay back then. <laughs> so you may have been the first pair of titties I saw in person at Bamboozle. Wow. Whoa, at really? Life, at a giant stadium at the time. I'm so sorry. How old were you? Ooh, maybe eight, 17. That was the first pair of days you saw in person? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So you've already seen this. I can just let him fly. <laughs> <laughs> was that in 2010? Yeah. That's well, 2000, yeah, 2010. That's when you were there. Were you that did, was the year? Or did, 2010 or 2012? No, 2010. Had to be 2010 or 2009. That checks out because I remember my guitar player <laughs> played the wrong chord during the bridge of one of the songs. <laughs> I never forget when I fuck up on stage. Really? I have a terrible memory, but when I mess up on stage, I never forget. Wait, that's haunting. Yeah, I know. It just stays with me for eternity. It really does. Does that make you a better performer, you think, or worse? Um, I think I'm um, OCD. Hmm. So maybe... Mm. And I'm a perfectionist when it comes to, like, my particular thing I do. Uh, what, what, is that, would you rather be a perfectionist or not? If you had the power to choose. Um, I wish I could be kinder to myself, but I like being a perfectionist because it helps me complete the task. Like, with the album, that's why it took three years. It's well, because we had to make every tiny little breath of sound in any direction sound exactly how we wanted it to. How do you know it was done? When I listened to the record and I had no notes. Wow. Are you okay? Oh no, she's crying. Wait, are you okay? Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> I was wondering what was oh, going on. Oh God, she worked with Meatloaf. I didn't oh know. my God. Wait, now I have goosebumps. He's one of the greatest artists to ever fucking exist. Oh my god! I did. I had no idea. Oh my god. Oh, he passed away. Yeah, me love. It. Yeah. My god. <laughs> like, oh, also, some of the greatest songs to ever be created. I mean, those are those are plays. Those are stories. Those are shows. Oh my god! She worked with him for like ten years. Wow, that's really fucking amazing. No. no. No, we love meatloaf. We love oh my meatloaf. god. I hate I actual didn't... meatloaf, but I love the person. No, I, love. the yeah. food meatloaf is repulsive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but him. Him. The artist. I oh my god, him. by the way, you know, one of those songs is about losing his virginity. It's a whole oh my god, that's like one of the most I remember listening to that record. I've listened to it all the time, but I remember listening to that song for the first time when I was a kid. It's, it's so good. Yeah, bad out. Holy shit. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, listen to Meatloaf's whole discography on Amazon <laughs> yes. Music, but you can also listen to Kesha's entire discography also on Amazon Music. It's all there, including Gag Order. Um, what are you thinking? I think we covered a lot. Oh, actually, upcoming tour, are you, how are you going to mix old songs with new songs? It's a great question. I'm actually taking, um, I'm taking ideas in because I want to, like I said before, like I love the songs. I wrote the songs. That's where I was in a chapter of my life. It's not It's not my fault that some of the memories are unsavory, you know? So I want to, and I want to give those songs to my fans because they love those songs and they've had memories to those songs. And once I give it away and once I put it out, it, it becomes not mine anymore. Mm. It now becomes about the fans and their experience with it. So if they come to my show, want to see a song, 
that I wrote that they've had great experiences too. I want to give that to them. Could you form new memories around those songs or is that just impossible? No, totally. And that's what I want to do. And that's like, that's what pulls me back to those songs is remembering my fans with the songs, not remembering my personal memories with the moments that I don't want to remember. Do you have a tour set? A tour set list? No, like ready to go? Like, are you like going to No, the road? I'm in the middle of like trying to figure out, I might do like Old Testament, New Testament, Ooh. or I might intersperse that together like a weird psychedelic trip all i know is that like i just announced day before yesterday and it's like all the meet and greets are sold out it's doing really well so like i'm adding more dates Damn. i'm going to try to get some international dates because my international fan fans want to like murder me so i'm like i really want to make sure i see all my fans and i haven't seen them in so long i miss them that's the best part of the whole thing if the music is the foundation and then the marketing is kind of building the innards, then the tour is when you, like the house is complete. Totally. It's a physical representation of all of it. Yeah. If the old Kesha is dead, are your fans still the animals or do they get a new name now? I have a question. Should I ask them? Yeah. Mm. Are they going to name themselves? You're going to give them the right? That's powerful. That's very 2023. Yeah. I'm actually curious what they want. Interesting. What would their new name be? Drop suggestions in the comment section below. Please. I'm curious if you're an animal or a new animal or a new fan or an old fan. What do you think my pet name for you should be? Hmm. Do you like sticking with, like, my name is still Kesha. That's my fucking name. They were just like, you know, spelling changes and there character. Were spelling changes. There were spelling rotations. changes. Rotations. So maybe they want a spelling change. <laughs> like we could put the S upside down in animals or something. But I want to know. I kept my name. So I'm curious if they want to keep their name. Speak up. Let your voice be heard. And while you're down there in the comment section, click the link to buy tickets to see Kesha on the road, VIP meet and greets, the whole thing. And also uh, listen to Gag Order. Listen to Gag Order. You will not be bummed about it. No, nah, 38 minutes, top to bottom. Give it your time and energy. Final thoughts, Daniel? I do think it needs a couple of listens, though, so listen to it a couple of times. Yeah, like have a glass of wine or like smoke a joint or eat some mushrooms or meditate, like whatever your way to chill is or just like sit there or drive or like tell your grandma, whatever. <laughs> but just like have... Have like a full blown listen if you have the time and would like to give me that. Because I really made this from like the bottom, like the innards of my soul. So, for all that Kesha has given to you, you should give this to her. <laughs> or I saw uh, Louis Capaldi, he started doing death threats. So, I'm like, should I just say, like, or I'm going to murder you. Yes. Like, it seemed to really work for him. But for me, I was like, I don't know if me threatening to murder people would work. <laughs> it's, it's a marketing tactic. It's a marketing tactic. Yeah. Or it suits him. Listen. Or she'll think about murdering you. <laughs> There's a link in the description below to listen to gag order. I really appreciate your honesty and your time today, always and forever. You really won in a trillion. and One of the greatest artists uh, that this generation has ever fucking seen, so... Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Thank you. And sorry, I was being a wild woman earlier. You were not. An though. outlaw from who is, outer space. Who's crafting this narrative? My head. That's Get mm. it out of your head, sister. No, I got the energy. I got that. I want to go kick stuff. Okay, go for it. <laughs> go, go hurt something. Catch everybody. Woo!